Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first ever recording of Finest Hour. Woo! And yeah, so I am. My name is Lance, and here with Lance is the one, the only, twenty twenty four GT winner, Nico Cavada. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I am joined tonight by Nico, who is also going to be representing us in the World Championships of Warhammer later this year. He's also the 2022, 2022 Munchkin Tournament Champion. All right, yeah, never forget that. Yes, so that was his first claim to fame and created this horrible habit of joining tournaments and stuff. But needless to say, we are from Bortilio and we really enjoy Warhammer and everything sort of related to that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so this will be finest hour where we talk about everything Warhammer related for exact, well, not really exactly, but roughly one hour, right? Yep. So this is the start and we are going to get the jitters out of the way until the chemistry kicks in. But the main topic of the night, some, um, for those who might be interested would be the difference between the old world and Age of Sigmar. Nothing Ooh. controversial Ooh. about this at all. Ooh, old world. I mean, <laughs> all right, let's see where we stand here. Yeah, okay, but so. yeah, before we start, shout out to Kevin. Uh, we couldn't have done this without you, uh, you bitch. <laughs> okay, so the the reason we're trying this podcast format in the first place is that Kevin once messaged to ask if we were ever going to do a podcast because he wanted to try learning how to sound edit. So if the editing on this sounds really bad, you guys know who to blame. The guy who always beats me at Blood Bowl because the referee always turns on me whenever we, we play. Man, who even plays Blood Bowl anymore? Like, for real. Get a real game. Wow. No, Blood Bowl is great. <laughs> Guys, don't listen to Nico. Blood Bowl is great. Um, <laughs> uh, I play Black Orcs. Don't you play, like, Snotlings or something? Uh, I caved into peer pressure. So, that's a yes? Yeah, all right. I play Snotlings, yeah. Yeah, so who plays Blood Bowl anyway? So, apparently, we play Bo- Blood Bowl. But, yeah, yeah we have apparently. a pretty... Yeah, but, but yeah, Kevin, uh, alongside his uh, our friend, Richie, are currently spearheading a Blood Bowl community here in the country. If you ever are interested, you guys should hit them up. Yeah, Richie, sponsored, sponsored ham. Yeah, King Su Ham. King not Su a spon- not sponsored, but you know, if you'd like to sponsor <laughs> us, that would be that'd be super sick. Wink, wink. Yeah. So we decided to give this 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 talk this topic a, a shot because. There's just so much going on right now. And as of last, as of earlier this year, Games Workshop has brought back the old world into being a regular product that they're selling and thus bringing like, and thus they want to expand on the lore of that. And I think that for a lot of us who got into the hobby through Age of Sigmar, we don't have a full appreciation of just how much of Age of Sigmar and Warhammer in general is tied to the old world, the very first game that Games Workshop created. Right. And to be honest, I'm really surprised they followed through with this. Do you remember when exactly they announced the old world? Because you and I started playing... Well, I started playing Age of Sigmar back in... Uh, when I was in college, right? I think that was 20, 2018, 2019. Uh, and I can't remember anymore when they teased the old world or when they announced it, but I remember it's been going on for a while, right? Yeah, no. So there's been an interesting clamoring for the old world to come back. And GW has been, I think, pushing for it or sorry, hinting at the idea of it for about three years now. Three years. Okay. As far so, as I remember, I could be wrong. I never. Wrong. I never caught on to exactly what the goal for GW was when they brought back the old world. But did they mention that they wanted to expand on the lore? Or is it just, you know, like uh, a nostalgia grab? So I think it is... The way they're handling the release, I think it is a nostalgia grab. Um, Cynically, that's how I feel. And I think that a lot of the old world hype is actually based around the the newer rank and flank systems that are coming out and taking up that market share that GW is not taking a bite out of. And also the su- the great success of Total War Warhammer. Right. But I mean, the Total War has been out for quite a while now and they only capitalize on this now. So yeah, it's kind of strange that of all the times to do it, this was the time they did it. But I guess they had to do it a little bit later because if they re-released uh, Warhammer Fantasy early on when Age of Sigmar was still finding its footing, 
I think it would have taken attention away from Age of Sigmar. It would have split sail, which is really difficult. Yeah, so Total War Warhammer actually came out in March 2016. Right. 2016, Warhammer Fantasy has been something you're very familiar with, right? I mean, you're old, you're a dinosaur, you've been around since Total War, uh, since uh, Warhammer Fantasy started, right? Well, not when it started. I was born definitely after it started. So I think War. Well, let me just check again. Warhammer Fantasy. Warhammer Fantasy. When First did it edition. start? You can see Lance's birthday there. Yeah, I know. So it actually started in 1983. The first edition was published quite some time before I was born, actually. Oh, okay. but wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, total. So here's the weird timeline. So it came out 1983, and Age of Sigmar debuted 2015. Total War Warhammer, the first first game, came out in 2016. So I'm pretty sure that this shift to Age of Sigmar might have been a shock to a lot of people. Oh, I'm sure. It wasn't a popular decision. And I guess we're going there right now uh, to that topic. We're going to start a bit rough where, let's be real here, the transition from fantasy to Age of Sigmar was not that smooth. It, it was not big. No, it wasn't. They had to nuke their entire setting through a story that was called The End Times. Yeah, so The End Times, which was seen by some people as great writing and some people as terrible writing. So it's actually a mixed bag, I think. I, I personally love The End Times. I thought it, it brought out the most out of all the races that existed, and it showed the ugly face of some of the racist lore. But right. I think before we dive deep into End Times, it might be good for us to talk about why the old world needed to come back in the first place and what we think is different between the old world and Age of Sigmar. Well, before we also dive into that, maybe we can also discuss a, like just very quickly why did it end, right? And not why Age of Sigmar had to happen. Fair. So, right. to my understanding, Games Workshop were not selling a lot of fantasy models. The game was horribly unbalanced. It was extremely prohibitive to get into it. You needed hundreds of models just to be able to field the 2,000-point army, which, to my understanding, was the standard at the time. Right. Space Marines outsold the entirety of the fantasy range. And sales were not good. Yeah, sales were not great. So I think it was a very brave decision on their part to have to nuke the old world and replace it with something that was a bit more modernized, can be streamlined, because I think that rank and flank might have been seen as a bit too prohibitive, or at least this style of Warhammer, which you know, w- which we're no longer used to, and we're still yeah, rediscovering. Just... When I was a kid, I played Eighth Edition, okay, and, and it, Warhammer was amazing. I I loved the lore, and the game was a lot of fun. But right. and I enjoyed it then, right? But looking right. back now at my games when I was younger, comparing it to Age of Sigmar, I feel that Eighth Edition is very antiquated, and I, that doesn't mean the game is bad. But I think it was a very good... I think until now, it holds up as an amazing narrative, thematic, and immersive game. More so than Age of Sigmar a lot of the time. But it was a terrible game for competitive. Well, I mean, yeah. Like, from the stories you mentioned from back in the day, it had really janky rules, especially that you played orcs, right? Yeah, so there used to be a thing called an animosity table where you'd roll a d6 for every unit that had five or more orcs in it. Yes. Uh, Correct comments can correct me if I'm wrong. But... If I roll a one, they they I roll on another table where to see whether or not they squabble, they charge the nearest enemy unit, or they charge the nearest friendly unit that they can charge. Do they have to fight that unit though after they charge? Oh, absolutely, yes. So you have to roll against your own guys. Yes, that is something. That is truly a game design right there. Yeah, but orcs were generally the Timmy army of the setting where. There were a lot of mechanics that we see in Age of Sigmar now that were born from there, like timber from the giant. Except right. instead of like rolling to see what where the giant would fall by competing with, you know, dice rolls, who rolls the higher die, it's you roll a scatter die, and the giant has a specific giant template, which I had to photocopy from the back of the book and cut out and place on cardboard. Photocopy? What's that? No, I'm sure I'm joking. You, you, silly. You're not you're not that much younger, dude. Okay, but like <laughs> It, it was mostly that. And they had lots of goofy things like Doom Divers where they strap a goblin to like a pair of wings. And it would be one of the strongest war machines in the game because it ignored armor altogether. And it just the, the D6 mortal wounds to whatever it touched. And another really interesting one would be the Fanatics. So nowadays, right. the Fanatics have a random move role where you can choose where they went. But with Fanatics back then, 
you could release them. And then after they were pushed out of their unit, they would move in a random direction. So there was a lot of like very narrative focused mechanics. Did yeah. they also slap back in the day, those fanatics? Yes, they were one of the few elements in the Orcish army that could just that could just break through armor. Because fanatics right now, when two point oh came out, fanatics were actually uh, pretty random as well. But you know, when they reined in all those random rules in three point oh, in Age of Sigma three point oh, they reined in the uh, the random mechanics a lot more. So yeah, but kind of sad. But you know, it had to be done if if the game wanted to head forwards a more competitive setting, right? No, for sure. But in terms of yeah, in terms of competitiveness, it was very janky. There were rules upon rules. But what was really cool about it was that they had weapon classifications. Like, for example, great weapons, hand weapons, and some great weapons, hand weapons. They had long bows. They had like short bows, and all of that would be the same across all armies. Okay. Right. So if you saw an elf with a great weapon and a dwarf with a great weapon, you know it gave plus two strength and strike last. Right. So there was a classification, like a generic classification for things. Yes, and the strength strength versus toughness was very relevant because back then there was no rend. The amount of quotation marks rend an attack would have is based on the strength of the attack. Oh, just like 40k basically. Uh, no, 40k has AP. AP, which but is like rend. doesn't it also uh, compare, you know, like toughness versus strength? Yes, so you need to compare strength to toughness to determine how much you need to roll to wound, but right. in this case it was an only how much you need to roll to wound, it was also it would also affect the armor save of the opponent. It was both rend and wound roll. Okay, so it's basically a lot of rules if we're thinking if we're talking about it. Yeah. And I think that it made the world a lot more internally consistent than Age of Sigmar. So in Age of Sigmar, like you have liberators, right? They're supposedly like super mega resurrected demigod people that represent the best in humanity, right? But then they right. wound on a four. Uh, yeah, no. They wound on a four, regardless of whether they're fighting a Mega Gargan or whether they're fighting a Grot. Right. So it kind of made no sense, right? You're fighting a Goblin and you're wounding on a four. You're fighting a Gargant, you're wounding on a four. I guess it also works vice versa, right? If a Goblin fights a Stormcast Eternal, which is basically a demigod, all I have to do is just roll good. And all the Stormcast has to do is roll bad. Which yeah, is kind of hilarious. Cause have you ever seen a Grot kill Archeon before? Because I have. <laughs> I bet. Was that your Grot? Yeah, that was my crack. Yeah, yeah, of course. It I have seen a single shooter take out Archeon with one wound left, hitting on fives, wounding on fives, and he was saving on twos. Yeah, I, I think it's more also possible in fantasy to do that. In, in fact, it's possible for a Grot Horde to beat Archeon in a fight without dealing any damage to him. True, but you know, it's not like you've never you'd never see that in a book where Archeon would just get pinged by a random arrow made from a that's, twig. No, that's true for sure, but. That's where I think the game diverges a lot from Age of Sigmar. It's very immersive because of the complexity and universality of some qualities, but you know it has to be complex. Different monsters had different psychologies, like stupidity. Like trolls were literally stupid. If you failed a morale test, they couldn't do anything because they're stupid. Mm -hmm. Unless you had like a hero nearby for you to use their leadership instead of, let's say, you know their own leadership of. Five, I think yeah, they were pretty pretty useless. Yeah, they were pretty useless. Mm, okay, so yeah, so I would say yeah. You know what? You're right. Narrative wise, it does sound like fantasy was better. I think it's always translated narrative better with how janky the rules are. But and I don't think I've seen Age of Sigmar do that just yet. You know, we have a lot of cool rules in Age of Sigmar for comparing the rules. But I think Path to Glory is the closest thing you can get to narrative. And I think Age of Sigmar is slowly getting there, where the rules are starting to reflect the, the lore. But it's not there just yet, right? Because it's, it's much harder to do it while maintaining the balance of a competitive game. Yeah, I don't know when Games Workshop started MetaWatch, but they've started to really care about the balance of the game, right? That arbitrary 45-55% to 55 range in which an army needs to win. They started caring about that quite a bit. I think, though, that Age of Sigmar does have a lot of mechanics that do reflect on the lore. Remember when Night Hunt came out, that the third edition book? We were so yeah. happy because it had a lot of very thematic components to it. Like whenever they charge, they would give a, a spirit, a ghastly effect because they're all about swarming people. They also have that effect where you can't make a uh, bravery save, bravery check next to them. They yeah. failed battle shock essentially every time you were. Um, yeah, I, I, I remember that. Yes, like I said. 
Uh, the game is slowly moving there. Age of Sigmar is slowly getting there. It just has to catch up. It still has to catch up. Yeah. So it's only been there for a few years, but every edition has been getting better and better. And of course. Yeah, and with that, the lore has also improved dramatically. And I think we're going to talk about the Dawnbringer series a bit later. But yeah, let's, let's talk about it later. Yeah, before we can get to that, I think another big thing about the old world that is a comfort to a lot of people is that it reminds them of Tolkien's work, right? It's traditional humans, elves, and dwarves. And the right. concepts are a lot more grounded. One thing that I like about the old world over Age of Sigmar is that it has a much more grounded sense of place. In Age of Sigmar, you've got pockets of reality, like the rel- like you got Ulgu and you got Gur and you got Akshi, but in the old world, you had yes. Ulthwa, you had Karakakara, you had Nuln, you had all these places that have these story histories and politics and inter, you know, where the existence of one thing is intertwined with the existence of another thing. Sorry, so didn't uh, old world technically mirror like real life, like countries and all that? Like, if we're talking about the settings here, right? Yes. So it re- mirrored the idea of nation. So I think that uh, the empire is based on Germany. Britannia is based on France. Yeah. Well, who yeah. guessed it, right? The orcs yeah. basically talk like, um, I think, Cockney English people. Right, yeah. Yeah, Cathay is obviously based on China. Kislev is based on Russia. Yeah. Oh, man. Arabi is based on... Oh, I wonder what Arabi was based on. Oh, wow. They weren't very creative with it. And honestly... The old world, you're right, is basically ancient Europe with a lot of, I wouldn't even call it races, like stereotypical stuff, really fun, interesting, and weird stereotypical stuff back in the day. What happens when colonizers make a fantasy game? Well, I don't know. L5R was pretty good, though. I do like Legend of the Five Rings, despite, <laughs> it, being, despite it being Asia written by white people. It's actually pretty amazing. <laughs> the best way. That's yeah, the best. Just- I've ever heard of it though. You just have to you just have to hand wave some of the ridiculous stuff and just learn to laugh with it. It's okay. Alright. <laughs> yeah, and, and you can enjoy it. It's basically Game of Thrones, but in China okay. written by white people. China. So it's or China Japan written by white people, but still it's funny. Same, same, but different. Yeah. So the old world had that had that sense, right? The the elves were noble and tried to work with the other races. They act they they felt like they were stewards of the world. So right. they taught humans magic. Teclis actually taught the humans magic. Teclis, who is a god in Age of Sigmar, was a talented mage back in. He was the a old nerd. World. Yes, he was still a nerd, and basically, like the more fragile, handicapped half of the twins between him and Tyrion, who has yet to make an appearance in Age of Sigmar. And they basically had this He Man Skeletor esque relationship with their dark rival, Malekith, who's been trying to claim the throne because he, yeah. he is entitled to the throne. He and his mother, who he has a very interesting relationship with. We're talking about... Let's talk about that real quick. Fantasy was not afraid to tackle very strange themes, right? I think we can agree on that. Yeah, there was slavery. There was a lot of depravity involved in it. Slanesh was depicted as far more hard. Incest, for sure. Yeah, so Malekith, the king of the Dark Elves, who was later revealed to be the king of all elves, what was in, had an incestuous relationship with his mother Morathi, who both how would, would wind up becoming important. That? What? How do they depict that? I mean, I'm curious. I've never seen, I've never read a book from Warhammer Fantasy that talked about <laughs> sensitive topics like that. I mean, it would never tell people that they had, you know, oh wow, in this scene, Malakith and Morathi just open tongue kissed each other. No, they're never gonna do that. So yeah, what they, okay, what like, they did was like that. Morathi would always just stand provocatively next to Malekith and artwork, and there would always be rumors and lore tidbits drop in multiple articles and stories that Morathi and the Malekith had a very intimate relationship. Oh, they just used the word intimate and it's open for interpretation. They used a lot of different words, man. Morathi was also the leader of a Slanesh sex. So was sex actually an open topic back in fantasy? I mean, if we... Okay, I actually well, think that it's something... No, it's not uncomfortable. I'm trying to remember but, where they tackle it. Obviously, like, Gotrick and Felix. Felix was more of a ladies' man. Right. Questionably so, because, you know, he, he was into a lot of people, and some of those people he was into would not, like, fly in mod- with modern sensibilities. Okay, yeah, no, I've seen the... I uh, Speaking of that, quick interruption right there. I've seen interesting lore, interesting artwork of uh, Old World. It showed, like, the many... The many women of the night that Felix slept with. 
the ladies of the night. Lady. Is that what you call it? Basically, um, basically hookers. Basically, I've seen okay, sketches sure. of like all the hookers that Felix has been with, and you know they're not the best looking ones, but it just shows that you know Felix is you know old shtick. It was interesting. No, yeah, no, for sure. So you know, it, it's never it's never written that they were prostitutes or whatever, but kind of heavily implied, you know. Well, okay. So, yeah, Felix has been with a lot of people. He's the ladies' man. And actually, I, I think Felix in the story represented more of the target audience, right? Whenever you read Blank Slayer, any God, Felix and Gotrick novel, Felix was the layman. He was the, the the normal dude who got drunk one night and it now has to go on these fantastical adventures. One of the things right. that I think the old world does a lot better than Age of Sigmar and Age of Sigmar could improve on is grounding the setting on their more human elements. Right. So you can't really relate to a golden armored demigod. And I think Games Workshop tried way too hard to put Space Marines in fantasy when they brought the Stormcast Eternals out. But I think that back in the day, the Empire were the quote-unquote de facto, not the de facto good guys. They, they kind of were, but they were also the de facto eyes and representation of the layman in fantasy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and I've read pretty cool stories about that. Yeah, so you had multiple nations, and you had politics, and you had elector counts who were always trying to vie for the attention of the emperor, or, you know, and they're always, like, dancing around politics. One of the elector counts was even, like, supposedly a vampire. That was interesting. Which one was that, exactly? Was this, uh... The Karsteins. The guy without the nose? <laughs> the guy who's like, this guy looks like dead, guys. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Wait, they didn't know he was a vampire this entire time? No, no. They knew he was a oh, okay. So Sylvania is an interesting place. It is technically part of Empire lands, but it became right. like the lands of the undead after a while. And depending on which vampire is monologuing, some of them believe that they are their own thing, and some people believe that they have the right to be an elector count and deserve a seat in the council. Yeah. So they just gave the seat to a vampire. No, that happened in the end times, I believe. But up until that point, it had been quiet. Everyone just hated the undead, and they were seen as others. You know. Okay, I guess what well, the fantasy. I I think I guess fantasy always portrayed the undead generally as the bad guys. Or yes. Creatures of the night. Yes. So one thing that that fantasy did very well is it showed that there was a lot of variations and diversity within each race. And I know yeah. that Age of Sigmar says that they do that, but. You don't get, I don't feel that as much. Like they, you read sub faction lore, you know that Gortide is different from Reapers of Vengeance. It's different from Scalfine Tribe. It's different from the Flayed. But in the old world, you kind of get that, got that sense. Like all the undead were all very different from each other. Like the Tomb Kings were very different from the Vampire Counts, and the Vampire Counts in themselves had very many different types of bloodlines. And you get that sense as well in Age of Sigmar. But they weren't like under these giant. The Grand Alliance umbrellas. All right, like uh, yeah. I kind of, I kind of get where you're getting get uh, coming from because I guess when they first announced when they announced Soul Blade Grave Lords, I thought to myself, oh great, like we've been waiting for this army this entire time, right? Right. And then they announced Ozir. Wait, sorry, Ozir Bone Reapers came out first, actually. Yeah. And then they released Soul Blade Grave Lords, and I was like, oh cool, we're finally having a bone centric army, right? And then. They announced Soul by Grave Oh, that's cool, zombies! And then I see skeletons, and I'm like, wait a minute. What makes these guys... It, it seems that, you know, it, it's a bit redundant. We got okay. skeletons, and then we got more sentient skeletons? No, Soul by Grave Lords are more the vampire counts. Yes, but I just found it strange that it was whole... There's like a whole spec- uh, death rattle that we call death rattle, right? It just right. felt very weird, considering we had Ozzy and Bone Reapers. And... I actually prefer Death Rattle in Soul Blight than the lore of Ozark Bone Reapers, personally. No, that's fine. One thing I'm not crazy about with the way death is handled in Age of Sigmar, although I think they're moving away, they're, you know, with the latest Dawnbringer book that came out, they're moving away from that, is that everything is technically under Nagash. It, it feels like one homogenous faction, maybe save Ushara and Allender. Even Manfred, who's known to be a finicky, finicky dick, dickhead, he kind of doesn't really do his own thing. Like, people see him as this conniving asshole, but I don't see him doing anything in the lore that reflects that he's a conniving asshole. Okay. Now, I, I get you, and we'll talk about that later, because I think it's slowly moving away from that now, like you mentioned. That's good. So You're right. Yeah. So, 
they they changed a lot of things with Age of Sigmar for sure, and they departed from their Tolkien esque roots, right? And right. I think this is for the better for the most part, although it needs a bit more time to cook. Yep. So where were so, we exactly? I think we cut off where <laughs> we were talking about the settings, right? Yeah, we're talking about the setting. So let's talk about like how a race is treated between Old World versus Age of Sigmar, right? Right. So in how the Old World, are... how races are treated, like how they departed from their Tolkien-esque roots. Right. So in the Old World, you have the High Elves. The High Elves are the quintessential good guys, an army of Legolases and, you know, Liv Tylers or something. Like they're all good guys. Right. And what they did, their main role in the Old World was to be stewards of the realm. To be the stewards, and they basically managed the entire place from Old One, and they partnered up with the with the humans to help them fight chaos. Okay, Teclas would even like be the ambassador to other races. He he was this very big optimist. He wanted everyone to work together. But if we look at Age of Sigmar, the elves have been twisted. They're now the Lumineth realm lords, and they're considered to be giant dickheads. The high elves were not always perfect. They had slaves and stuff, right? But the Lumineth realm lords basically try to control everything around them. They believe that they know every know better, and instead of harmony, what they want is control. Have you ever read about Settler's Gain? Do tell. No, I, you know a lot about, about this a lot more. Right, Settler's Gain. So, since we're talking about elves right now, you're right. For a setting where fantasy is supposed to be a little bit grim and grim dark, you know, that all that, the the elves are like the altruists, right? They they always have the best in everything. They try not to strive for everything. In Age of Sigmar, where it's high fantasy, they kind of twisted that in the sense that they're very self righteous, right? If I'm correct. If correct me if I'm wrong, if, or maybe the somebody in the comment section correct me. Settler's Gain is a city of Sigmar, basically, where it's mainly dominant by elves, specifically Lumineth realm lords. And you know, in Age of Sigmar, cities of Sigmar. Is a uh, it's a coalition between elves, dwarves, uh, humans, basically, right? Right. All right. So Setter's Gain is an example of that. Except in this city, the dominant uh, race is the are, are the elves, and they're stewarded by by the Lumineth Realm Lords. And the reason why it's called Settlers Gain is you'd think that the settlers would gain something from staying near the elves, but it's actually the elves that benefit from people staying with them. And they have education camps apparently in that city. So, <laughs> whoa, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So that city, that that city is basically dominated by dominated by elves, where they teach humans magic, you know. Uh, but you gotta follow the law. You gotta follow their rules, their etiquette, and all that. And people have slowly started, you know, speaking out of how they're being treated because you know they're second class citizens, right? And these people that speak out tend to go missing at night and it's because they're being escorted to education camps where you know they're re-enlightened by the lumen oh, man. so what happens to a re-enlightened human well they just go missing oh That's basically it. They, they go missing these are basically just death camps yeah well well i mean you're being sent forcefully to a uh, camp for re-enlightenment i think some of them actually make it out but you know it's not really for the better if you catch my drift like they're yeah, so what happens to them? Oh, oh, they're, oh, man. So they're basically, they become elf simps. If you ever go to, like, uh, if you go to China, something like that, you know, what you hear about these urban myths of uh, co- like re-education camps, you know? Sure, urban myths, yeah. Or uh, quote-unquote urban myths. CCTP, please don't hunt me down. Wow, but, very yeah. brave for our first podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, push all the buttons, I guess. Pressing all the buttons yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we we want listeners, right? So at least now they're listening to us. Yeah, fair. In case you were falling asleep, yeah, Nico just made a political statement. If China is now listening to us. Is your phone lighting up? No. So anyway, <laughs> shut up. Okay, so the elves have settlers gain. They're all about controlling and being really messed up in that sense. Right, yeah. Okay. So how do you, th- how do you feel about the way other... Oh, yeah, because you, you never really did uh, Ages uh, Old World, right? Yeah, I think that I, I think a lot of the allegiances are a big blanket representation of how a race was fractured or changed. Like the dwarves, for example, in the old world, they're all very traditional. They're stalwart. They believe in technology. They believe in gunpowder. They believe in staying in their mountains. But right. the old, the end times screwed them so badly 
they fa- they fra- in Age of Sigmar they're fractured into two major factions: the Caradron overlords who have completely embraced technology and have rejected their gods and taken to the skies, while you have the Fire Slayers who whose entire sole purpose is about bringing back their god. Right. You have the two extremes basically for the religious aspects of the dwarves. Yeah, and while one of them became extremely into technology and rejected gods, the other one became extremely traditional in in form, but, but not in spirit, in that they've abandoned honor, right? You told me one time that the Fire Slayers did, did horrible things when bribed with gold. Yeah, well, well I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell a quick story about that after we tackle the dwarves a bit. You know what, now that you've mentioned it, it's, I, did, I never realized we only had two factions for dwarves. It's very underrepresented. Yeah, what makes there. you say that? Well, I mean, Warhammer. I mean, old world always felt like you know, yeah, it was one army, but they had a shit ton of stuff going on for them, right? I would argue that Age of Sigmar has a lot more going on with dwarves. You know what? Yeah, no, I take it back. You're right. Uh, chaos, chaos, a whole, a whole kind of worms when we're talking yeah. about diversity. I feel that Age of Sigmar took a brave with the way they handled dwarves just because of how scumbag, how scummy they feel right now, right? You've never, you've never expect a dwarf to be that scummy when you read the stories. Uh, you mentioned the uh, fire slayers being dishonorable. I'd argue, uh, actually, fire slayers, which used to be what, just slayers back in uh, fantasy, right? Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong. Slayers were one of the one of the most honorable races, right? This is where basically where Godric came from. Yeah, they were so shameful that because they had some sort of failing, they felt dying an honorable death was the only way to self-actualize. Right, right. That's so, how gung-ho they were from. That's pretty honorable when you think about it. And, and the first time you he- the first time you hear about their lore, you think, yeah, that sounds about right. That sounds about like what a dwarf would do. All about or they they'd rather die with honor, basically, right? Yeah. With fire slayers, it's a mixed bag, you know. I'd argue fire slayers are more honorable than the KO. Than Caradron Overlords. Caradron Overlords are basically yeah. pirates that stick to the code, but the code is basically just a guide. Uh, it's just basically a uh, a guideline. It's not the law. Yeah, and they interpret it based on convenience, right? It's yes, the so pirates, yeah. right? Yeah, they're pirates. They're they they pirates. just have to have a semblance of honor so they can maintain some sort of society where everyone is self interested, but yeah. inherently no, selfish. What? Yeah, because no one would. Because they're traders, they're pirates, they're seafarers. Oh well, skyfarers, and they're uh, merchants. They're they're traders. They deal with the economy. If if they didn't live up to some code, I don't think any race would deal with them ever. So that's the difference between. But fire slayers, on the other hand, you're right. They're more traditional. They stick to their laws. But I would argue that they've done a lot worse things. I guess. Than the Caradon Overlords. Do tell. You know what? I'm not even sure if they've done worse things than Caradon Overlords. Because Caradon Overlords are much pettier. and Well, not pettier, but they will screw you over for gold. But I've read stories where... You know, you know Lethis, right? Lethis is a city in Shaiish. Another yeah. city of Sigmar in Shaiish, right? This is basically where Catacros, uh, a Mortark of Nagash, was being held before his release. So basically, the story goes. The story goes. Lethis is a city, as usual, of Sigmar, which is co, which has a coalition of dwarves and elves, and this has a mixed bag of Stormcast Eternals, right? So, getting the help from Caradron overlords and fire slayers entailed that the Stormcasts would have to pay them with gold, Aether gold. But Caradron overlords are paid via Aether gold, while uh, fire slayers are paid by Urgold. Urgold is what they believe. Is that right? Uh, Grumni is the... No, not Grumni. Um, Grimnir. Grimnir. Grimnir turned... Basically, Grimnir in Age of Sigmar blew up into thousands or millions of pieces of Urgold. So they get paid in that. So the city of Lethis, being in Shaiish, was under siege by Nagash's night haunt. The, the ghosts, basically. The ghost armies, right? And they had these gates that were patrolled by fire slayers and dwarves and you know other races. But the fire slayers were... Growing a bit impatient because they haven't been paid in months, basically. I think it's almost a year. And that's because someone has been raiding the gold caravans that were being sent to Shai- uh, to, uh, to Lethis. Right. Yeah. So, one day, 
uh, one night when everyone's asleep, someone goes knocking at the gate, right? It's a ghost. Ghost whispers, say, like, hey, open the gate and we'll pay you with gold. Like, you know, the gold that they haven't been paying you, we'll pay you like double that. Right. And it's actually the, the gold that they, they're offering to the fire station is actually the gold that was being stolen by the caravans. Because obviously it's been implied, uh, I mean, it's heavily implied that it were, it was the night hunt that was raiding those caravans, right? Because fast ghosts. Right. right. So something I still find a hard time believing when I first read that story was that the rune father actually fucking opened that gate. He let the ghost in. He took the gold. He let the night hunt in. And not only did he let the night hunt in, the the fire slayers actively participated in killing the Stormcast Eternals. No, that's actually crazy. He went all the way. Yeah, he he didn't just, you know, like, like fuck it, right? I'll open the gate and leave. Nah, he opened the gate. And there's this really cool art, though. There's really cool art of a fire of a fire slayer rune father standing over a Stormcast Eternal with his great axe. Like, about to strike him down. Okay, question. Do you think that they were dishonorable because they accepted a bribe from the Night Hunt, or do you think they felt insulted that they weren't paid? Which do you think was the bigger driving motivation? Now, that's a good argument. You know, they do need to get paid, but back, you know, with the Cities of Order, or the Cities of Order were always working for the betterment of mankind, or the betterment of, uh, you know, the mortal realms, right? So, yeah. despite not being paid, I get the whole grudge thing, but really, you're gonna help Nagash. This was already post uh, Nagash's betrayal with Digmar, right? No, I'm not, betray- I'm not arguing. I'm not saying that they should do that. I'm asking. So we're saying that they're dishonorable, right? Because right. they did scummy things. Right. My question is this: Do you think that they were their motivation is gold, or do you think their motivation was that their honor was spurned? Right. Yeah, they're, they're basically it's like. You promised to pay us, they didn't pay us. So this is what you get when you don't pay. I guess it was a little bit of both. Because yeah. Fire Slayers, aside from gold, Fire Slayers whole shtick is also, you know, grudges. And right. a dwarf can keep a grudge. They really do keep grudges. Yep, that's but their think, whole shtick. Yeah, that's their whole shtick. So I guess it was that, you're right. I guess it was less about gold. But I mean it, it could have been. No, I mean yeah, I'm not saying it was less about gold. I'm I was asking a question. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, after, you know, saying this all over again, I think you're right. I think it was more about pride than gold. But either way, that was fucking hilarious. That, that, watching that was, uh, well, reading that was actually something. Yeah, you should, you should give that a read, Lefis. Yeah, there's a lot to read now. There's a lot of lore that recently came out. Yeah, it's funny. You don't often expect it. You don't often expect wanting to read it now. But, you know, after seeing how far Age of Sigmar has gone with lore, it's nice to dive back a bit, you know, like back to its roots. What is its roots? Its roots is old, the old world, though, right? I mean, sorry, not roots in terms of uh, not roots in old, like old world, but like like this, the very beginning of Age of Sigmar, the Realm Gate Wars. You know, before all we, because we have all this fancy shit right now, right? So it's nice to read about like Lethus wasn't even a city of Sig, wasn't even classified as a city of Sigmar back then. So that's interesting you know like it's nice to read back into the old lore okay so i think okay a way to ground this would be to talk about gotrek since we're talking about the fire slayers already right gotrek oh, yeah. was hurled through space and time and basically took the place of the god grimnir and took wait correct me if i'm wrong right he took the place of the god grimnir fought through the age of chaos and was spat out in the age of sigmar after fighting for basically an eternity you are correct. He was he guarding couldn't. the gate, basically. Yeah, so he couldn't die. And while Felix was the representative of us as human readers in the old world, Gotrek has become the representative of people transitioning from the old world to Age of Sigmar because Gotrek is a relic of that old world. And then he, right. there he is interacting with the Fire Slayers, interacting with all the Dynath Deepkin and all these other races. And he slowly takes a liking to Age of Sigmar and its denizens and how it's different. But, you know, it's different, but still good. So it's Games Workshop's propaganda, right? Trying to tell, tell old world players, yeah, it's a little different. But if Gotrek can like these guys, maybe you can like them too. All right, but to be fair, Gotrek kind of represents also like the old world people. Uh, the... That's what I said. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm calling it. 
But Gothic does not like the new world. Does not like Age of Sigmar. Yeah. Actually, my dad recently read some Gothic novels from the recent times. And he didn't like it because he felt that he felt Felix's absence. Aww. Right? It's not even because, I think, because Felix was like the character he liked the most. Maybe he, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But he grounded the setting. Age of Sigmar is like anime. Everything's so wild and fantastic. You got That's gods, true. like dwarves riding magma droths, like dwarves that can fly through the sky and create like anti magic, you know, devices. But it's not grounded in the sense of place, it's all pockets of reality. You know what? That's actually very true when I read the stories. Oh, this happened. But he suddenly cast a spell and the lore and the world split open. Uh, and, and then a grand, and then Marathi casted like, uh, Marathi casted this huge spell that opened the portal that set the crap, like, uh, crack goes away. You know, all these big things, you know, it's very wild, right? Yeah. I it, think Age of Sigmar's biggest weakness is that it focuses a lot on gods and big personalities rather than the little guy. Right. Um, when I read an Age of Sigmar book, I love the stories about the small guys and not the gods. Who's who's your favorite small guy? Small guys. Oh, I don't mean like a specific small guy, but I love reading stories about oh, like this free guild, this free guild fusilier. I love reading the letters of this uh this female fusilier. Sure. Uh, it goes it it catalogs her her journey through the the Dawnbringer quest or the the Dawnbringer crusade. And, you know, the ending where she finds out that she's going to die, so she writes the last letter to her daughter and to her dad. You you feel the pain, you feel the despair, but you feel also the hope in her letter. It's because, you're right, it's grounded, right? If Age of Sigmar did more stories like that, I think they'd get a lot more, you know, a lot more praise with the lore. Which is what Felix did, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. I've, I've read one Godric and Felix book from the old world, and I loved it. Which one did you read? Which is the one where they fight Belakor. Oh, okay. This is All the right. one where Max, I think Max sacrifices himself. Oh, okay. It. I'm not super familiar with that one, so you're the subject matter expert here. Yeah, well, I mean, I read it in passing while I was painting. Oh, yeah, it's an audiobook. Audiobook, so you listen to it, yeah. Yeah, so basically it's when Max, uh, Max is the old wizard, the old college wizard, right? So Max is all senile, but he sacrificed himself in the in their flying ship, I guess. Headed off Bellafor. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm, no, that's so fair. that's an example. So your dad didn't like it. That's disappointing. I yeah, I kinda okay. like the Godric books. The first two Godric books were a bit weak, but the Ghoul Slayer, I have a bias there, obviously. I think Ghoul Slayer was hilarious, as well as uh Git Slayer. So what do you um you've read both an old world fan uh Gotrick novel and well listen to an audiobook. And you've right. listened to like more recent ones. How do you feel about the difference in writing style and focus? Uh, you're right. Uh, but Felix did add a lot of flavor back in the old books. Uh, Snorri, all those old characters, right? Like Snorri, Felix, uh, who's got, who's Felix's child bride? I don't know who you're talking about. Yeah, that, oh, well, I mean, Felix did marry, I mean, he didn't marry a kid. He did wait, though. But okay. Uh, well, awkward. So you're, you're accusing him of being a groomer. Well, I mean, isn't he? But uh, I don't know, man. Magic is magic is weird. But the newer books, Gotrek, it felt a lot more grounded compared to other Age of Sigmar books. Just because Gotrek is Gotrek, you know, he gets drunk. He likes partying. He likes drinking. He likes beating the shit out of people. It was fun to read, but. Realm Slayer, that specific book felt a bit weird just because it dealt with Seraphon and you know I, I'm not really a huge fan of Seraphon. They're they're like one of the most anime anime armies in the book, you know. Flying temples, laser beams, space battles and all that. Yeah. That's why it felt a bit weird. I also think that with the earlier books, Age of Sigmar was still trying to find its voice. Yeah. Although I did you know, like the old yeah. early books with uh Realm Slayer, I did like reading about corn. That was really entertaining. Uh, tell me about it. Who was Corcus Cole's mortal enemy again? Vandus Hammerhand. Vandus, right. So the, the the whole conflict between Vandus and Corcus Cole was pretty entertaining watching Stormcast get humbled. This is the first time a Stormcast has ever died, which was hilarious. Because Corcus Cole has the reality splitting axe, right? Right, yeah. So 
their whole rivalry was amazing. Just just reading about, I think this was a Realm Gate Wars book where the setting is basically where Stormcast Eternals come back to the mortal realms for the first time. There are still people that are fighting off chaos or running away or hiding from chaos, right? But the way to describe it, these are basically like decrepit. You know how how you picture a post-apocalyptic world where you have all these people eating scraps, uh, you know, drinking their own piss and all that. They're all miserable and running away from cannibals. Sure. So that was the setting, and that was pretty cool. Watching Corgoskull lead a band of cannibals, where they force you to join them, or they eat you. And if you want to join them, you got to eat your friends. I I actually feel like the first in the first edition lore of Age of Sigmar. They tried to go very 40k. Right. Big armored dudes, like in desperate situations, beating the shit out of each other. It feels yeah. very, yeah. The way Corvus Skull is designed, the way the Stormcast are designed, they feel like Space Marines. Space Marines versus World Eaters, basically. Yeah, that's how it feels like. Yeah, but I loved it. I love that setting. First Ed was amazing with the setting. I I personally think First Ed, even though they were still finding their footing. Uh, it told one of the best, the, one of the best stories. Sorry, we were talking about Warhammer Fantasy before, right? Let's dive yeah. in about Age of Sigmar a little bit more now. First, Ed had a lot of cool stories like that. The Realm Gate Wars introducing Corvus Cull. Have you ever listened to the audiobook where Manfred helps the Stormcast Eternals? I haven't, and sadly, I don't have the mental bandwidth to read, to listen to an audiobook. I get right. really annoyed when I miss a detail and I have to go back to an earlier part. So I'd rather read a book, actually. I'm, I get that. I'm very. I'm a weak, like, listener. I I get that. It's a short. It's a short audio book. It deals with something. I I really hate Stormcast names. This is what I hate about Age of Sigma. I can't remember their names. I only remember that the name was Bullhart. Like the last name was Bullhart, right? Sure. And they fight Manfred basically in Shaiish, chained up, and they don't even reveal that it's Manfred until they release him. And then, oh look, it's me, Manfred, and nobody knows who he is. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Manfred actually helps them out because this was before he was reinstated as a Mortar, right? Sure. And sure. Manfred here in this story remembers the Stormcast Eternal that saved him, the uh, something Bullhard. Because you know Stormcast Eternals have glimpses of their past, right? Yeah. So apparently yeah. Manfred and this guy knew each other in their past lives in the old yeah. world, which sure. was really interesting, right? And this guy, long story short, uh, they're trying to make it, cause they were trying to make it the Shaiish, the free, the, the, okay, Stormcast Eternals trying to bargain with Nagash. What can go wrong? This is them trying to, yeah, trying to broker peace. And then Manfred is like, oh, don't do it, guys. Don't, don't do it. This is a bad idea. And then they still do it. And when Nagash is about to, like, devour their souls, Bullhart, had the chance to escape, and then Manfred was a, had the chance to escape, and Manfred was like, hey, I owe you my life for saving me. Run away with me right now. We can still make it out of here alive. And then Bullhart just sacrifices himself. Huh? How? Wait, save. wait, what? Sacrifice himself to save who? To save his, uh, his uh, warband, basically. Oh, his okay. Actor. So it was funny, because he sacrificed himself, which managed to hurt Nagash a bit, but it destroyed his soul, so he couldn't be reforged anymore. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. That's sad. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. So it leads to another book where one of the one of the guys from the warband who never trusted Manfred, who was the, the only stained person who never trusted Manfred, goes on this goes on this quest in Gur. His he goes on this quest to fucking to, to fucking try and capture Manfred for his betrayal. Yeah. And it was such a trip. Being in Gur, having to fight orcs, iron jaws. There's this one scene where Archon where Archon and Archon's undead, uh, the orcs, and the Stormcast Eternal. Sorry, so uh, the last thing you said was, uh, because we got cut off, the recording kind of stopped. The last right. thing you said was that you were in Gur fighting, you, Stormcast said were in Gur fighting orcs, and, and yeah. it starred the one guy who didn't trust Manfred. Yeah, so the one guy who didn't trust Manfred basically goes hunting for him, Gets the help of Archon apparently, because Archon also was ordered to like retrieve Manfred. And they got the they got the orc to help because they beat the orc in combat and the orc had to like help. They agreed to that. Which is hilarious. I, was this Iron Jaws or Cruel Boys? Iron Jaws. Cruel Boys okay. never existed back then. Oh, Cruel this was not... first, second, and okay, yeah. Yeah, something like that. And uh hilariously Manfred was hiding with the flesh eater courts. 
so he had to play along with her delusion just to make sure that he could seek you know he could seek uh you know refuge with them yeah but then you don't remember who this guy is right uh which one the stormcast who was the protagonist all their names are forgettable you know no see that's another problem we don't have like we don't have memorable characters yet all i remember is vandas vandas yeah you know you're right that is a problem with stormcast the story the story was great it was engaging the name forgettable stormcast forgettable what made it amazing was just basically the 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 other guys which is a lot of which is which is a huge case of age of sigmar the other guys are way cooler who is the other guys you got like the undead. You got Manfred. You got like the the Iron Jaw, the, the Big Red. They call him Big Red. Who's who's the Big Red? He's the uh, the big mega boss that they had to beat in combat. Oh, so oh okay. Out. Yeah. So there's like a okay. sign that's it. basically there's a sign that introduces him as the Big Red. That's fair. I think immortal demigod anything becomes less interesting when they're the main characters. It becomes a lot more interesting when they start dying. You know. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure, and it is unfortunately very lazy. But they call the the way to stop them is through what Corgus calls a reality splitting act, like literally yeah. kind of lazy naming, anti plot armor, basically. Yeah, Corn just got so mad at reality that he made a reality splitting act. Sorry, I think I've been rambling on about um, you know, Age of Sigmar now for the lore. Well, it's not rambling; it's a podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's true. We're here to talk. I'm listening, and you're talking. That's this is yeah. Fun. All right, so what else do we got? Because we stopped with we we, we straight so, from Gothic, we straight from the dwarves. Did we miss out the humans? I guess we can talk about humans real quick. Um, sure, we can talk about humans. Although for me, so in third edition, which I think is the best Age of Sigmar edition based on what I've been reading, right. there there's a massive focus on humans now, right? There's also yes. a lot of like very good stories you can tell with the other races with Stormcast, all that stuff. But now we're finally getting to humans during the current story arc called the Dawnbringers Crusade. And yes. this is about two crusades, twin crusades, because they have to go with the twin tailed comet theme because they're huge Sigmar nerds. They, All right, they yeah. have to go through, they're sending a crusade out to Akshi, the realm of fire, and Giran, the realm of life. And their goal is to establish new cities in these realms. Yeah. And along the way, they meet all this fun, all these like other factions for models they want to sell, right? <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. So right now yeah. we're on our fourth book, The Mad King Rises, and you tell me you're enjoying this one a lot. Yeah, no, honestly, I never thought I'd get into Cities of Sigmar. Uh, in the old world, we had the Free Guild, and now we still have the Free Guild, but we call them Dawnbringers now, right? Yeah. We call them Dawnbringers, and it's great. It's refreshing to see new models. I'm tired of seeing old old monkey models. But sure. we're talking about Dawnbringer Crusade specifically, correct? Um, yeah, the current story, The Mad King Rises. So basically, when these two, um, each Dawnbringer book that comes out, comes out with new rules, new sub-factions and stuff. But yes. it also comes out with the story of the two crusades, of what's happening and actually what's happening in Gairan. And right. in the first book, they talked about the setup where they were hit by a plague that's causing depression and stopping people from being productive. It's Nurgle's way of sabotaging the crusade before it even starts. The second right. book was Reign of the Brute, where they ran into an army of Iron Jaws they ran into King Broad in Gairan and Trog Trogherd in Akshi. And they talked about how each individual, like each crusade, led by a different like leader and how they, ha- you know, I talked about how they handled it. In Gairan, they have a calm, methodical scout lord, while in Akshi, they have Fedra and a very fiery, impulsive, and brash leader riding on a manticore, of all things. Right, yeah. Yeah. And then they move over to the Long Hunt, where they have to. Bargain with the Sylvaneth to pass through the, the, the woods. And over in the Akshi side, they meet up with Vandus Hammerhand and Ionus, one of the right. best model games workshops ever released, which sheds some more light onto the deteriora- deterioration that Stormcast Eternals have. So, so for first time listeners, Stormcast Eternals can never die. They get reforged by Sigmar every time they die. They go back to Azir, but a bit of them gets lost. So they, they slowly succumb to mental deterioration. And right. Ionas, the Cripborn, who used to be a terrorist from Shaish who opposed Nagash, was reborn as the first Lord Relictor, basically like a sort of chaplain, like fellow in the Stormcast Eternals. And his whole shtick is making sure that the Stormcast Eternals stop this mental degradation whenever they die. That's his goal. He's trying to stop. That's it. his mission, right? That's his yeah. whole life. Yeah. And the long hunt is basically like 
a love letter to first edition lore where they take down the blood stoker and the blood secretor of Corgus Call, the banner bearer and the whippy and the, the whip master. And Vandas Hammer, it shows Vandas Hammerhand has slowly lost his compassion and his humanity because he refuses to help the Dawnbringers. And his priority is always to chase Abercorgus Call, who is the champion of corn and the ender of like millions of worlds. Hey, is Vandas the one that glows because he died and that's his defect? I have no idea, dude. <laughs> dude, legit. I just know Vandas Hammerhand is the one who rides a Draco. Yeah, but there is a Stormcast. Yeah, no, that no. I am correct. That is Vandas. Correct me okay. if I'm wrong, listeners. But Vandas is the one that even Stormcast is afraid of because when he was reforged, he was also he also glows in the dark. Why are they afraid of him? Because he glows in the dark. You don't know what it is. That's fucking terrifying, dude. Like if you saw me glow in the dark, I don't know where it's and it's scary. Well, if you were a Stormcast Eternal, I'd be less scared because then you can't sneak uh, up to me in the dark. That's true. I, I you see you coming from a mile away. <laughs> but you see this big ass dude just glowing in the dark, and apparently it just you know it scares them because what if I die and then I get reforged and now I glow in the dark too? I don't know. But they describe it as an eerie glow, which hilarious. You know, sorry, yeah. uh, <laughs> sorry, back to topic right there. No, so no, that's no, it's the, okay. Yeah, so that's the that's the first dawn. That's the first half, right, of Dawnbringers. Well, no, that's the first. I explained the first three books, so you gotta talk about Mad King Rises now, right? Well, Mad King Rising, I fucking love this book, and it adds one of the best death armies in the in the, in Age of Sigmar. Actually, even in, I would argue, if this book, uh, if this army came out back in Warhammer Fantasy, I think this would sell like really great. Can you imagine if we had old world narrative rules with fleshy supports? Can you imagine the potential for rules? The how the vampires that, that the Flesh Eater Courts are based off of in design are called the Strigoi. Yeah. The Nosferatu, basically. Like, all these bald yeah. vampires. Well, not bald. But they were the big, buff, bestial vampires who led ghouls into combat. Yeah. Because I remember, so, like, these are old models, right? The the whole drag... Uh, Tergeist and Zombie Dragon were old models. Yeah, and the, the vampires, the Arch Regents, those are Strigoi vampires. Usheron himself used to be a vampire, but he was a goody two shoes vampire. So the other vampires hated him and basically manipulated a bone splitter wa to crush his entire kingdom. Wait, so was there an actual Usheron model back yes. in fantasy? Oh, uh, I don't think, I don't know if there was an Usheron model. I just know that, um, Usheron was the brother of Neferata and he was the goody two shoes vampire. Who saw himself as as a king, who wanted to make sure who wanted to treat the human like servants, not sorry, as subjects, not cattle. Yeah, I know the lore. I know how the lore goes. I am just surprised that that lore stretches to the old world. I remember reading some stories about Usharan back in fantasy, right? Sure. Yeah. So kind of interesting. Anyways, so uh, we're talking about Usharan. So. Basically, uh, Mad King Rising, it focuses on Usharan and his release. Like you mentioned, back in the old world, Usharan was the somber paladin. That's how they describe him. I love the book. And, uh. So what, what happens in the book? So the book is, you know, with, they just released the Usharan model now. And apparently Usharan was released. Remember that old, that old setting with Age of Sigmar, uh, where Sigmar loses, he goes apeshit because Nagash betrayed him. And he he abandons his post and goes on a rampage in Shaiish to destroy all the gates and all that. Wait, who are you talking about? Uh, Sigmar. Okay, sure. Yeah. So you remember when Sigmar goes apeshit because Nagash betrays him, right? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so basically, so Usharan was being kept prisoner by Nagash this entire time in something called the Shroud Cage. Long story short, just like Sigmar destroyed the Shroud Cage in his, in his spitting rage. And his radiance apparently drove Usharan mad. But he was already mad before that. But sorry, it drove me... the shroud yeah. cage is what the prison of Usharan. Yeah, it was the prison that Nagash put Usharan in, basically. Okay, that's where that's where all these uh, all these spirits and ghouls were like tearing his sanity apart. That was Nagash's punishment for uh, Usharan. And what Usharan, uh, Usharan, it's not clear in the books actually. Oh, okay, it's Usharan, not revealed yet. It's it's not revealed clearly. Usharan basically witnessed something. He did something about it. Someone was stealing grave sand. He came back mad. And according to the, you know, ghouls, the way ghouls tell the story is that Nagash saved Usharan from his madness and put him in the shroud cage 
to cure his sanity. Basically, like it's to nurse him back, nurse his sanity back to you know back to health. But the way others perceive it is that Usharan was actually being driven even more mad by Nagash because what he witnessed wasn't actually people stealing grave sand. It was actually Nagash transporting shit. I don't know. The story is very blurry because it's being told from a mad person's perspective, right? Oh, its perspective is from the ghouls? Yes. Oh, that's actually kind of that's kind of awesome. I just got my copy today, so I'm going to try to read and catch up soon. Right. So this isn't in the Mad King Rising. Huh? This isn't the Fect lore book, but it leads to Mad King Rising. So basically, Sigmar breaks Osharan free. Osharan goes walk mad. Uh, Osharan goes wild because of Sigmar's glowy bright light scare him away. Osharan fucking gives birth to Fect by spreading his, his insanity. So, mad, long story. Okay, let's jump to Mad King Rising. Mad King Rising basically is the story of the plot moving forward with what Soul Black Gravelords is doing to the cities of Sigmar. So, you know, with the Dawnbringers slowly expanding their presence in the mortal realms, right? Humans are right. gaining their, their land back. So, what Neferata is doing is she's extracting blood from Usharan. They call it King's Blood. And okay. they, they put them in wine bottles, they mix it with wine. And they ship them out into different cities. And basically, it infects people into madness, right? So, okay. That's the story right there. So, Usharan plays along with this because Usharan's still eager to serve Nagash. But out of nowhere, Stormcast Eternals, along with cities of Sigmar, arrive at his doorstep. They needed, they needed to pass by that area on their Dawnbringer Crusade, right? So, Usharan fucking welcomes them for dinner, for a feast. And it's wild. Can you imagine walking in this huge ass castle filled with dead bodies and you have to play with their, you have to play along with their madness, right? But yeah. this, in the story, what do you call this? Neferata. Sorry, not Neferata, but Neferata's handmaiden, you know, the new snake lady? Sure, yeah. It's, Sek- it's Sekar. Yeah. Sek- Sekar, right. So Sekar does, did not like the fact that Usharan invited the cities of Sigmar guys and the, uh, the Dawnbringers and the, uh, the Stormcast Eternals over. So what she did was she charmed one of the fusiliers or one of the free guild captains so that during during, during their meal, that, that captain defiantly shoots Usharan with a special bullet, basically, that hurts him. You can imagine how this goes. You, you shot their king in front of all these ghouls while you're surrounded by ghouls, right? Yeah. So that, that happens. All hell breaks loose. But it turns out Usharan was a step ahead of Sekar and he was aware of the betrayal that was being plotted against him. He was only pretending to be crazy. He still is crazy, but he knew. So basically, after when all hell breaks loose, apparently the ghouls started to take out Sekar's handmaidens first, the vampires first, and not the Cities of Sigmar people. Right. So there was this really cool scene where when Ushran gets shot, he fucking flings his arm and it takes the head of one of the vampires, and it wasn't even intentional. But it's starting to look a lot intentional now. So it slowly dawns on Sekar that holy shit, Ushuran was aware of my betrayal the entire time. Because the way he sat them during dinner, he split up all these vamp all her vampire maidens, so they'd be far apart from each other. Like in between each vampire there'd be like ten ghouls, twenty ghouls. Oh shit. So they all Yeah, dude. So they they tore they tore Sekar's people apart. Of course they took out some Starfcast Eternals and some Cities of Sigmar people, but they got away. They got away basically. Mad King Rising that happens, and at the end, Neferata is pissed about what uh, about what Usharan did. And it turns out that the ships that were being used by Soul Black Gravelords, right? Neferata, to ship out the King's Blood? Yeah. Yeah. So those ships were owned by Soul Blights, but they were being manned by ghouls. The crew were made of ghouls, because of ghouls. So apparently they also revolted when Usharan got shot. They felt that presence throughout the realm. And the ghouls revolted and killed everybody on that ship. And it pissed Neferata off. And basically, you know, more Tharks threatening each other. And it turns out Usharan was aware this entire time. And he outsmarted Neferata. I think it's brilliant that the, the guy, the, the scariest thing about the insane guy, or the more Tark of delusion, Usharan, is that you don't know when he's lucid and when he's being batshit insane, right? Yes, that's exactly the... the, the oh sorry, my I, god, I, so... I could be a better storyteller, but that's basically that's basically what happens in that. So he fucking played it perfectly, right? He betrayed yeah. Neferata, he outsmarted Neferata, and there was this really cool threat about like, hey, like Neferata's like careful, careful Usharan. You play old games and suffer old punishment, basically. 
Uh, you oh, play, that is such play, a good threat. Play stupid games and you win stupid prizes. That's basically yeah. the line. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then basically, Usheron just replies, like, I miss our, I miss these old Jeffs with you, sister. I should show up in our master's meetings more often, me think. So that means okay. he's going to participate more with uh, the Mortark meetings, which he never did. Okay, so they're building up to the story arc where the Mortarks are going to be pitted against each other, I guess. Yes. One way or all, another, right? But in a way, they have to work together because they still have meetings. Nagash isn't gone. Nagash's physical avatar was destroyed by Teclis like, yeah. back in both realms. But he still organizes these meetings among Mortarks, right? Like yeah. his spirit does, right? So Usheron never shows up to these meetings because he's never invited. Nagash covets Usheron's service but he despises what Usheron is because Usheron's madness defies the predictability of the undead. It defies yeah. that. So people, so that's how he catches people off guard. But it also defies Nagash's belief about how necropolis should be sterile with undead only. Yeah, so I think that's interesting because whether you're in the old world or in Age of Sigmar, the one thing that's consistent about death is control. Is control. But this is something that Nagash can't have with Usheron. Yeah, because he wants to control something that is naturally extremely chaotic in nature, right? Right, yeah. So that's kind of cool. So uh, I guess we're about to see whether or not, you know, Nagash can bring him to heal. And I'm actually kind of excited to read the book now because we're going to see whether he can bring Usheron to heal or whether Usheron can <laughs> keep outsmarting his fellow Mortarks and yeah, and you know, foiling Nagash while Nagash is technically sort of gone. You don't see that often either. Somebody outsmarting Neferata. That's true. They even released in her regiment of renown that she can change battle tactics just to show how smart she is. Like yeah. If you fail and, a battle tactic, you can really you, you can just change it. Yeah, she's basically uh, plans within plans within plans, basically. Man, that's kind of that's cool. And you know what? The hour is up. I had fun talking about this. We could continue this some other time. Maybe when yeah. I've read the Mad King Rises, we could have a, a more in depth discussion about the lore. Yeah. So quick. Quick recap. I know we delved into Dawnbringers a bit. We kind of strayed from the old world topic a bit. But to marry the top, to marry the uh, the discussion of Dawnbringers and the the difference between old world, Age of Sigmar had a lot of catching up to do with the lore. And Dawnbringers is a great start for that. Yeah. It's starting to pick up with uh, more grounded more, more grounded characters like the Mortarks and, you know, non-god god beings, basically. Yeah. I also think that one advantage is Age of Sigmar has and the way it's set because one thing I said about the old world that was good was it has a good sense of place, right? But yeah. just like a Saturday morning cartoon, it has to go back to that sameness, right? Only big events can only happen in like far-flung regions in the old world while yeah. in Age of Sigmar, we are everywhere is kind of relevant right now and everything is constantly changing and moving forward, which is one yeah. of the things I really love about the lore and the setting for AOS. Right. So, like you mentioned, the hour's up. Uh, I guess we can make, we can make a part two if there's still more to cover. But I guess we'll plan it out soon. Yeah, we never t- we never really talked about the end times, and we could probably yeah. talk about Mad King Rises a bit more later on. And if people have suggestions of what topics we want to cover, we they want us to cover, we could try that. Yeah. Till then, thank you everyone for joining us. If you enjoyed that, give us a like, give us a subscribe, and comment down below on what else you want us to talk about. Or yeah. give any kind of suggestions for people who are trying to do this Age of Sigmar Warhammer podcast thing for the first time. Do you want to talk more about lore? Do you want to talk about more about the competitive scene or whatever? Yeah, feel free to tell us. Uh, Nico, any parting words for you? Blood Bowl's a real game. Play Blood Bowl. Yeah, play Blood Bowl. Anyways, thanks everyone. Take care. Bye bye. All right, peace.